so hi everybody uh, my name's Ange Brennan um, and I um, I like to think of myself as uh, collecting different mycology organizations to work for um, I currently work for Life Worldwide, um, which is a global education uh, charity. Uh, I work very closely with Professor David Denning to sort of spread the word about, um, uh, about fungal infections and provide educational resources uh, across the world. Um, I'm based in Manchester and I also help out at MFIG, that's the Manchester Fungal Infection Group. Um, I work with um, them on doing some public outreach um, activities. And I've recently just um, put another feather in my cap and I, I also work with the Centre for Medical Mycology in Exeter. And again, there I deal with their public engagement and sort of raising the profile of fungal infections. Um, if any, anybody can recommend any other mycology organisations I can work for, I seem to be collecting them like a top trumps <laughs> deck. Um, I was keen to talk to you today uh, about some of the, the developments in aspergillosis treatments. Um, I, I felt that sometimes we're very negative about, uh, uh, we, we, we focus we focus on the downsides, we focus on the, the symptoms and the treatment plans, but actually I want to, to people to see that there is hope, that there is work going on constantly in the background to fight aspergillosis and to uh, bring in new treatments, new diagnostic tools and, um, and also to spread global awareness. Um, I'd like to highlight that I'm not actually a medical mycologist. Um, I'm, I'm not even a scientist. My my background is is not in science. So if you have a lot, if you have some scientific questions, I may have to pass them on to to colleagues to answer. Um, but but hopefully I, I'll I'll give you I'll give you the layperson's talk around these new developments. Um, I also wanted to let you know that the research is happening everywhere. Um, it was brilliant having Animesh on screen um, just to give you an idea that, that this work is ongoing and this work is going on across the world. Um, so we are working together. And the more we have events like this, where we get people from across the globe to come together to discuss their research, the, more, the quicker we are going to get cures, vaccines and any other new treatments and new, uh, new approaches to treating aspergillosis. Um, to my work at Life Worldwide, I briefly mentioned it's we focus on global education. This networking around the globe is it, it is vital to spread research and to and to also focus on sharing resources with um, countries that that might not have the gold standard labs that might not have ways to access these these extremely expensive tests. But there are ways of diagnosing and treating fungal infections that don't rely on these expensive methodologies. And we need to be sure that we're sharing this One Health um, vision for the, the rest of the world. This is why we make sure all our resources at Life Worldwide are free to access. We want anyone across the world to be able to, to access them, whether that is a student or whether that is um, somebody who's working in medical mycology. This is very important that we don't put up a paywall to these services. And again, one of one of my roles is to go out uh, and visit conferences and, and visit different countries and actually promote the work that um, that Life Worldwide is doing. And David Denning is also a, a great globe trotter. He's he's forever off in conferences, meeting people and and just spreading the word about fungal infection education. Uh, the Centre for Medical Mycology in Exeter is, is a really large medical mycology lab based in the, the south of England. It's looking at developing new treatments. It's got some exciting new things coming through and it focuses on training new researchers and scientists so that we are continuing to have generations of medical mycologists working on aspergillosis. It also focuses a lot on public engagement. We're really trying to raise public awareness of fungal infections and the, the kind of negative and positive outcomes that they can have. When I tell people I work in fungal infections, 
most people think I work in teaching people about athlete's foot or thrush, but it's these diseases like aspergillosis that have a massive global burden and we need to make more people aware of this burden. And that is how we're going to access research funding and, and more scientists being, being trained. So I feel I've got a really important job in telling the public how important funding and research into these infections is. So before I go on to the positives, I thought I would look at the, the sort of issues that we come up against. Aspergillosis is a, is a tricky little bugger, it really is. Um, it has a broad spectrum of clinical presentations. Animesh and Paul have talked a little bit about the different types of um, aspergillosis um, you can get. For example, you have your, your chronic pulmonary aspergillosis aspergillosis, which is a very slow and progressive and destructive disease of the lungs. Um, but it occurs in people who are non in, I can't even pronounce it, non immunocompromised or minimally immunocompromised. So it's people that are not very sick, um, but the, the disease lasts for quite a long period of time. Um, you Common symptoms of CPA are things like fatigue and weight loss, breathlessness and a cough or coughing up blood. And this is one of these conditions that is often mistaken um, for another disease. And that is people often think this is tuber tuberculosis. Um, whereas things like invasive pulmonary aspergillosis that tends to occur in people who are very, very poorly, people who've got acute leukemia, who've received stem cell transplants and solid organ transplants, especially within the lung. Less commonly, although we do see it, um, is invasive aspergillosis when people with COPD, um, also people in medical intensive care and with autoimmune disorders. Um, but these diseases are more prevalent than and transplanted patients. And um, we think that the, the percentage of people with uh, the transplant patients with invasive pulmonary aspergillosis is very high. Um, Animesh has also uh, mentioned the fact that COVID threw a bit of a spanner in the works with um, our, our, our learning about um, aspergillosis. And this is, this is one of the other issues we have, is the condition changes and involves very rapidly. So we have now, we've now got influenza um, um, affecting aspergillosis as well as COVID. Um, and this is affecting treatments and research. Um, aspergillosis also is very interesting. It has got very complex chromosomes and the way they arrange themselves. It's got something called horizontal gene transfer, which I don't quite understand. But if you want to know more, I'm sure I'm sure the professionals could tell you. And it's got this contributes to a great uh, amount of natural variation in aspergillosis. So that means it makes it very hard for us to to treat because it keeps changing. This complexity can be shown in the different jobs that aspergillus can actually carry out. Um, on one hand, we've got the aspergillus that makes you very ill. But on the other hand, we have the aspergillus that is used in our food. We're actually eating it. Um, so we have aspergillus niger. This is it's a biotechnical cell factory and it's well it's used in um, the food industry. It's also used in cleaning products and as an additive in cement. Um, so aspergillus nigillans is very important for genetics and cell biology. We can run a lot of tests on that. Um, you have got Aspergillus orizae, which makes um, sake. You have Aspergillus soji, which also makes soy sauce, and Aspergillus coache, which is again used in brewing alcohol. So it's very, Aspergillus is such an unusual creature because on one hand, you have got orizae, which is used in the making of soy sauce and fl aspergillus flavus. These are very genetically similar. They share 99.5% of their genetic identity. Yet the first one, aspergillus orizae, is, is used in cooking. 
but aspergillus flavus is is incredibly dangerous and it's a destructive agricultural pest and it produces mycotoxins so it, aspergillus is is such a broad a, a broad thing to study it's so different it causes a, such an amount of head scratching from the scientists and this <laughs> this is going to continue i think for a while one of the other issues is because it's so clever and because it evolves so fast, it be keeps becoming resistant to drug treatments. Um, as humans, we don't do ourselves any favours by overusing um, the antifungal treatments that we do have. We use them as um, to pr uh, protect crops as well as in for medicines, and this leads to an over an overdose of antifungals within our system, and that leads us to resistance. It's also very tricky to diagnose. Um, I mentioned before that uh, it's often overlooked in things like tuberculosis, um, and it's associated with a wide range of comorbidities. The gold standard diagnostic tests are only available in a handful of developed countries, and in low resource countries, they may not have access to um, to adequate mycology lab facilities. Again, Animesh was pointing out the situation in India where not all lab, lab facilities have access to a, a medical mycologist. So we need to make sure we're developing things that appeal to a global audience that everyone can use and that is, tr is treating aspergillosis around the world. And again, when we look to India, we see that the treatment there is very different. And this is a way we should be communicating with other medical mycologists around the world to share the information. The other, again, Animesh mentioned briefly the issue with global warming. The world is getting warmer and this is making a, a, real, a real potent environment for aspergillosis to, to flourish. Also, pe more people are becoming susceptible to these fungal infections by um, using increased amount of um, immunosuppressant um, treatments, which lowers your immune system, which means your body can't really fight off the attack from, from aspergilla uh, aspergillosis. The other main thing with aspergillosis is that we eat around us every day. We can't live in these isolated bubbles. We we breathe in, it's in the air around us. This, this makes it incredibly problematic because you can't stop breathing air. So we have to learn to sort of live in harmony, harmony with, this, with this fungal infection. Now, I feel I've started off my, uh, my, my upbeat presentation with all the, the sort of negative things. So I wanted now to, to just tell you help is at hand and to not to worry about it. I wanted to kind of look at the different ways that we diagnose aspergillus and asper aspergillosis and the sort of flip side of these negative facts that I've said about the condition is that more people are becoming aware of the danger of fungal infections. Um, you might be aware of Netflix's recent documentary on fantastic fungi and that really captured the imagination of what mycelial networks can do. Um, you may have read Merlin Sheldrake's book, Entangled Life, that was a, a worldwide bestseller and it was all about um, what, what mycelial networks and mycology can do for us. Um, I also wish I had a pound for everyone who's asked me if I've watched The Last of Us, this new TV programme all about zombie fungus and how it's going to take over the world. Um, I feel that, that we've really, we're riding the wave of a little bit of fungal zeitgeist and that people are starting to realise that this is an issue and it's been talked about a lot more and hopefully more and more research has been carried out. Um, so we have got some new developments due to this increased interest in mycology as a subject and this is hopefully leading to more and more funding and more people interested in pursuing a career in mycology. So I just wanted to give you a little taste of some of the, the things that can be done to help identify aspergillosis. Um, these are super important because um, at the base of everything we do, 
we say that a quick diagnosis of aspergillosis, it, that is the main thing that affects patient outcomes. We really need to be getting these diagnoses quickly. So one of the most important things to do is working on these global networks. So what, what has been released is um, some algorithms to support these diagnoses. Um, there's a number of these um, algorithms and guidelines that mean that anyone across the world has a tick box of tests and processes to go through to arrive at a diagnosis. Before this, um, the guidelines were a little bit piecemeal across the world, but this gives a gold standard in how to uh, look at a patient and decide if you need to progress with uh, looking for um, fungal infections. Um, on top of this, the World Health Organization has also got very involved. Um, they have released their fungal pathogen list. Um, and this is a list of the priority fungal pathogens that the World Health Organization want to invest funding and research on. And you will you'll be glad to hear that um, aspergillosis and aspergillus is on that list. So this is the importance of working together and working across our global networks. I also mentioned the fact that um, the COVID has put a little bit of a spanner in the works, but the the speed of research and the speed of development of research has been absolutely phenomenal. So already we have got some um, some of these these guidelines for dealing with with CAPA, so that you uh, clinicians and people on the front line can realise when a condition may be a fungal infection. We have got some new tests that are being developed. Um, for CP, CPA, the key diagnostic tests are, are serum, um, IgG, um, and radiology, and they are to detect uh, cavities or nodules. Um, Aspergillus fumigatus IgG antibodies are detectable in 90% of patients because we breathe the spores in every day, so we do have that, that, that sort of intrinsic um, ability to fight them, but we will have developed some form of tolerance. Um, sometimes we need to go down the route of biopsy or excision, so actually having some surgery um, to, to um, get a sample of the lesions showing hyphae um, within, a, within a cavity. Um, you can also, um, for CPA, you can also take uh, sputum cultures, which is not a very nice thing to think of, but, uh, um, and there are PCR tests for CP, CPA. For IPA, invasive pulmonary um, aspergillosis, the key tests are CT scans, biopsies for histology, and antigen tests or, or PCR on blood. Again, you can use sputum um, and you can use microscopy for hyphae. It, my, the, the microscopy you can use, but the microscopy is when you grow a culture and that can sometimes take a little bit of time. Um, no single test can confirm the diagnosis of invasive aspergillosis and different tests perform differently in different patient groups. Um, so we really need to be working on developing better tests uh, and, and quicker tests to ensure that diagnoses are coming in. Um, are coming in. Um, I read an interesting study on something called high volume culture. I was saying earlier about the, the, the sputum analysis and um, usually when you have a sputum sample, it is diluted and then a culture is grown from it. But this is a new process where actually sputum is not diluted. So actually you're dealing with a, a full sputum sample and it, it cultures much more spores um, and actually can be used to identify fungal infections. Um, one of the really interesting bits of research coming out of medical mycology is, is mapping the genetic risks for fungal infections. There have been some interesting um, studies carried out in haematology patients about certain um, certain genetic factors that are that are missing, and it means that you are more predisposed to fungal infections. So this is an interesting part of research, and this is this is um, hopefully something that's going to be taken taken forward and really make a big difference in the fight against aspergillosis. 
So we've talked a bit about how to diagnose aspergillosis. Um, so once you have that diagnosis, how do you treat it? And one of the issues that we've, I think all of us have mentioned is this idea of treatment resistance. Um, because we are using azoles uh, to treat crops and also as an antifungal treatment in fungal infections, it means that we are getting a, a double dose of azole treatment um, into our bodies. And this is what is leading to, um, to resistance. Our body just learns how to, to cope with, with the drugs. But there are some there is some really good news coming out. There are some really exciting treatments. Uh, and I think the some of the, the PhD students are going to talk about this a bit more after my talk. We've got some new drugs coming out. Um, some of them I can pronounce, some of them I can't. Um, Ibrexafunga is one I can pronounce, and this is a, a really fascinating treatment that was licensed for um, treatment of candida. Um, and it has now been look, uh, been it's in a stage three trial, which means it's it's quite close to being released. Um, uh, as uh, it's been tested for aspergillus in intravenous form. There's been some new uh, posiconazole studies that have come out that uh, have indicated that it is um, has the same treatment outcomes as voriconazole, so it can now be used as um, as a treatment for fungal infections. Right, this is where the, this is where the science comes. The hard science comes back in again. Um, this is interfering interfering gamma studies, and this is this genetic predisposition to um, fungal infections, and this is patients with chronic pulmonary aspergillosis actually are shown to have impaired in interfering gamma interfering gamma production in their blood. So. Immunotherapy with interfering gamma could be beneficial for patients showing um, impaired production CPA. This is called immunotherapy, um, and it, th this is a fascinating um, way of dealing with a drug, uh, dealing with a, an infection. If you ask any doctor what is the best way to deal with an illness, um, they will say it's with your body's own defence mechanism. So immunotherapy is what helps your body to boost its own defences. So in essence, uh, they, this immunotherapy is helping your body to fight off the, um, the fungal infection. One thing that, that we are, is in early stages of research is looking at a vaccine, um, being able to, um, if you, we know you're susceptible, being able to target a vaccine to mean, to mean that you do not um, catch a fungal infection or you, you are immune to, to the spores that you inhale. Um, so that's, that's quite exciting. Um, there's been a lot of talk about um, the existing azoles uh, not working as well as they should do. Um, this has led to more research into treatment regimes in itraconazole, and it was found that um, patient outcomes were much improved when the treatment regime was up from six months to 12 months. So even when we have an existing treatment, we are still working on how to use that treatment for the best. These are some of the, the, the drugs that I can't pronounce. Um, I will mention a lot of them, which actually has been developed here in Manchester. Um, so we, we're very proud of that. And that is again, very close to being actually released. Um, I don't know how to pronounce these two, so I'm not even gonna try, but these are, these are new, um, uh, these are new drugs and new drug types coming out. And I've listed three of the main ones here, but there are there are dozens of these currently under development. And this is hopefully going to lead to new treatments and improved outcomes for anyone with aspergillosis. So one of the, the most important messages I want to give over is the fact that everyone is working hard. These are some of my colleagues at Manchester Fungal Infection Group. And they, I watch them working every single day, looking for cures, looking for new diagnostic treatments, um, looking for um, genetic knockouts. And the work that they do is absolutely incredible. Um, 
as a patient, you may not necessarily see this side of the work that we do, this this day to day working and experimenting, trying things over and over again. But I wanted to assure you that not only are we working hard in Manchester, we're, we're working hard across the globe. We're talking to each other. We're running events like this. We're making the public aware. And that is all working towards getting better treatments, better diagnosis and better patient outcomes for everyone with this disease. And I hope that gives you a little bit of hope and a little bit of an optimistic uh, spin on the day um, be, because we have reasons to be optimistic. We are we're winning. As aspergillosis might be uh, might be evolving and trying to trip us up, but we'll get there in the end. And we've got um, we've got brilliant people working on it and working on it so hard. Uh, and I that's my talk. I hope that gave you a little bit of an idea of what's been going on in the world of of aspergillosis treatment. And I hope that it, that gives gives everybody a little bit of hope for the future. Thank you very much. That was brilliant, that. Thanks, Ange. Uh, we've got a couple of questions in the chat. Uh, if you can't answer them, Ange, don't, <laughs> don't worry about it. What we can do is, is, is chuck them across to, to someone who might be able to and get a response back to those that have asked the questions. Uh, but the first one is, is PCR specific enough to be considered diagnostic assay to complement or switch culture? As I said, if you can't answer it, uh, that, that, that is beyond that is beyond my scientific knowledge paul i saw if david anyone, was on as well <laughs> if, if anyone who's on can answer any of these questions please feel free to chip in but if if you're not there just they're not going to know we'll get them pci we'll... works pretty well and yeah there are, some, there are some nice pcr tests Thanks for that, Paul. Uh, Ange, this one you probably can answer. Uh, is there a need for any patient engagement at the Centre for Medical Mycology in Exeter? This is a patient who's based in Cornwall. Oh, yes, yeah, so there's lots. Um, if um, I can, I can give you my email address directly. Um, I'm reasonably new in role, um, but I, I'm really, really keen to get some um, some patient engagement as well. And we're looking at setting up a patient board to sort of advise us on what things um, they'd like to see and what, what sort of things they need. And we're aware that there's not really that level of support in, in the southwest. Um, so, yeah, we, we're definitely developing things for it in Exeter. That's brilliant. Thanks for that, Ange. Uh, Tom says, as somebody recently diagnosed with CPA, sincere thanks for the work uh, that you and the rest of the team do. Uh, we've got another question, which is probably more one for, for Paul. Have we seen an increase in the variety of species diagnosed with techniques like Malditoff? Um, Malditoff's coming, uh, and it's a really interesting way to do the diagnosis. Um, it's a little bit less used for, for fungi at the moment. Quite a bit of work on Candida with it. Um, it relies on culturing a single purified colony out of the, out of the sample. So it's, it's got some slight limitations in, in that respect, but it can be very accurate and it can be very quick and it's very cheap as well once you, once you get it going. So it's, it's a great hope for the future that we, we have nice um, MS-based tests. And I, I think we had one delivered a few months ago. Yeah, yeah. Uh, knack. Yeah, yeah, that's brilliant. Thank you, Paul. Uh, we've got another thank you uh, for Ange. It says thank you for the uh, positivity. It's much appreciated. Uh, Gwyneth says that she's on gamma interferon, and that's made a difference. And then we've got one more question, and that's uh, as someone with ABPA, I was interested to hear about the foods uh, aspergillus is in. Is there any way of going on on to which foods are high in it and which to avoid? Um, it's it's n not to do with that. It, these are these are types of foods that are safe to eat. Um, they, they, you will not come to any harm eating these. Again, I'm sure I'm correct in saying that. But um, it, even if you have aspergillosis, I don't think you have to avoid soy sauce or um, I think corn is another one that's got it's it's got microprotein in it. So um, yeah, don't worry about the, so, the, the so things that are in your food. Mark is a different fungus. So so with these foods, they've been developed by um, literally uh, fermenting with uh, 
usually an extremely evolutionary uh, specialized form of aspergillus. They pose no danger that we know of to the foods that result and the supplements that result from that process.